baby dedication in church. Um, it takes on a whole different meaning for me over the last few years now. You know, because you, everybody stands up, yep, we're behind your parents, yep, we got your kids, yep, we'll get them through Sunday school, yep. But when rubber hits the road, and as a dad, you're like, I'm done being a parent. It's you guys, it's my church family that have to take her now because I can't. And you guys stepped up to the plate. Um, you guys were on your knees praying. A lot of our family was praying for Elijah. But without a whole family of people praying with you and knowing that Mike, we got your back. Mike, this is what's going on. You're in our prayers. That's what, what this harvest family is about. So when we do a baby dedication, I want everybody to think about that. Where's that, where's that baby going to be in 15 years? 18 years? 20 years? Elijah turns 20 tomorrow. Her and her sister. They're, they're twin girls. Um, her sister is one that you can still be on your knees about. Some of you probably are. I know some of you are. I talked to you um, about it. But it's a birthday tomorrow. So um, with that, I will hand it over to Elijah because Todd told me to keep it short. So <laughs> but I just wanted to say for, for myself, thank you, church family. And this is kind of because of what you guys do every Sunday, every Wednesday in, in Bible school, in Bible study, in Sunday school. This is what happens. Your efforts don't go unnoticed and, and aren't for nothing. So, I like the here you are. Thank you very much. Okay, hi everybody. So, my dad said, my name's Elijah, and um, this is my home church. This is where I grew up. I was in youth group here since I was in, since I was in um, third grade. And um, so, yeah, so I'll just start at the beginning. And the beginning is a little bit confusing, so we'll get through it together. So, when I was a baby, my twin sister and I were adopted um, by Sean and by Mike um, as soon as we were born. Um, so we were with them from four weeks or something like that and um, grew up pretty normally. Uh, my parents are both really involved in the church. Um, we were at church multiple days a week cleaning. My mom did youth group. My dad helped out wherever he could. And um, So that was pretty much my life was just at the church. But it was the second place just for us to be near there all the time and we had friends there that's where that's where we had play dates that's where we had everything um so i grew up and i had a pretty i mean average um life um up until about second grade my biological mom who was in and out of my life we saw her every now and then like once every couple of months um she passed away from cancer when she was 25 and i was about seven um i remember just coming down the stairs my mom like trying to settle us down and be like, hey guys, you're not going to school today, you know, Mama Rachel passed away, and instantly, like, my sister started crying, and I just, I didn't really get it, I was just like, oh, okay, all right, we'll see her later then, I don't really, I didn't really get it, so it was really hard for me to process then, because I didn't understand that she wasn't coming back, that I wasn't going to see her until I went to heaven, um, and then within about a year and a half of that, um, we also moved. Um, from in the city to out in the country, out by Fleet Farm, and so we moved schools, we moved houses, we moved everything, so it was just a lot of transition in a little bit of time, losing my mom, losing my school, losing our house, it was just, it was a lot, and um, at home, my sister has a lot of behavioral issues, so that impacted me really big too, my parents really had to focus on her and um, keeping her okay, so I just always felt kind of pushed to the back burner, like they would like, turn around and be like, okay, good, Elijah's okay, okay, let's focus on her, and um, so I always kind of felt like I didn't fit in. I didn't really know where my spot was in my family, in my school, with my friends. I just always kind of felt like I was the outsider. Um, so when I was in fifth grade, my parents divorced, and that was, again, another big transition, and that's really when things started to go downhill because it was just so much. We moved houses, the whole custody arrangement was crazy. It was just such an emotional time for everybody. There was a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness on all parts of it. Um, and so it took a long time to try to adjust to that. We ended up moving in with my grandma for a short period of time, and then that didn't work out, so then we moved out um, to the trailer park. And um, so that's where we were for a while. So it was just trying to figure out where, where I fit in when. 
um, being at my dad's house every other weekend, and then we found out me and my sister can't live together because we'll kill each other, so <laughs> then we had to be split up, so like I was with mom Monday, Tuesday, we'd switch Wednesday, Thursday, the weekends we were together, it was just so crazy. And, um, so I was trying to find a place where I fit in, so I started with relationships, because all my friends, you know, they were in relationships, and I thought that would be great, but you know, Men aren't perfect, nobody's perfect besides God, and they always fail you. So um, when that didn't work out, I just, I didn't know how to handle it. My parents weren't together, my sister and I weren't getting along, I just I felt like I had nobody. So some friends um, in my sixth grade class, they told me about cutting, about self-harming. Um, and at first I was just like, yeah, okay, that's kind of weird, whatever. Um, and then... One day I decided to try it when I was really upset, and instantly for me it became an obsession. For a lot of people it's just a phase that they go through in middle school, high school, you know, it's just something that all their friends were doing, but instantly, all the time, anytime I had any kind of negative emotion, I'm like, okay, I'll just self-harm, okay, I'll just self-harm, okay, I'll just self-harm. Um, so I started in sixth grade, and I did hide it for a while, but um, eventually my parents found out, and so I was in and out of therapy for years. Um, this therapist didn't work, that therapist didn't work, she's not trying. Um, so, the, throughout my entire childhood, my parents never let us stop going to church. And I hated it for the longest time. Getting up at 7 o'clock in the morning to be here, I hated it. But every single morning at 7, my dad would flip the lights on and be like, Come on guys, half an hour, let's go. Um, so, throughout that whole time I was in church and it was... Um, I went to Districts, the youth conference that's coming up here in a couple of weeks. Um, I went my freshman year, I think. Um, and the speaker there was super powerful, and I ended up um, giving my life to Christ that weekend. Um, I thought that I know, I knew what the commitment was that I was making. Um, I thought that I was ready to, you know, be a Christian and live this Christian life and everything, but I didn't really understand what that meant at the time. And as time went on, it kind of got twisted in my mind. Um, I was really good for a, a couple of months. I stopped self-harming, I changed the friends I was with, and I tried really, really hard. Um, I ended up getting baptized here um, at Crystal Lake. Um, but then after that, it just got really confusing. Um, my sister, because of her behavioral issues, was told that she was no longer to go to youth group because she was distracting the other kids or whatever. And then I was like, well, I don't want to go without her because we're twins, we, we do everything together. So that kind of was the first thing that was like, oh, I don't want to go without my sister, but okay, I'll go anyway. Um, and then after that, I had people really, really close to me um, say, Elijah, don't you think you're taking this Christian thing a little too seriously? And I was like, no, you, you can't, but it was just all the time, just like, do we really need to pray when we're out to eat? Ugh, do you really need to bring your Bible to, to school? Like, um, So that just really, really, really discouraged me. Um, so eventually I just started slowly, slowly backing away from the church. Um, when I was a sophomore, I ended up getting into a relationship with a really, really awful person. Um, it was like a super codependent relationship. We would self-harm together. We were just so self-destructive, destructive to each other, um, with our words, with our actions. We would fight each other all the time, but I just wouldn't break it off because I just, I didn't know where I fit in and I still, I'm like, oh, well, maybe I'll fit in with him. And I tried so hard to make it work that it got to the point where um, I couldn't stand to be around him. And my friends, um, when I was a sophomore, as well, all of them that saved me a time span, um, I was entered into Rogers Memorial Psychiatric Hospital in Oconomowoc for the first time. Um, that was in June of 2014. Um, when I got out, I was just so embarrassed. Like everyone knew where I was. Everyone thought I was psycho now, and I was just, I was just so embarrassed. Um, so that whole summer really is when things started to take a turn for the worst. Uh, I had met a friend my um, when I was in the psych hospital, and she lived in Juneau. Um, so I started hanging out with her. But what I didn't know until I started hanging out with her was that her parents were drug addicts. Um, and I didn't really think anything of it. I'm like, oh, her parents are so cool. We can do whatever we want. We don't have to be in at a certain time. Um, so I loved going over there, but we slowly stopped hanging out for a while. And um, in October, I ended up going back to Rogers um, after for severe self-harm and um, suicidal thoughts and actions. And I ended up being there for two and a half months because 
they just didn't know where what to do with me really. I couldn't be out in the real world. I came home for three days, and within those three days, um, the cops were at school for me because um, I said I was going to try and kill myself that weekend. So they said I can either go and be on a 72-hour hold, or I can go back to Rogers. So back to Rogers I went, and they just they didn't feel comfortable releasing me because they just they knew that I, it was going to end it. That's what I wanted to do. So um, after being there for a long time, and them talking with my parents and trying to figure stuff out. They tried to send me to a residential program in Indiana, but it turned out to be awful, and I was there for like three weeks, and uh, my dad came and got me under the condition that I'd go to day treatment, um, which is like outpatient therapy. It's like partial hospitalization. You're in therapy, in group therapy, working on stuff um, for six hours a day, I think it was. So I did that for a couple of months, but Things just didn't go well. My family dynamic was crazy at that time. We would be screaming at each other. We had to have like three staff members in our family meeting because I would walk out, my parents would walk out, people were screaming at each other. It was just not good. So they ended up um, graduating me, not because I was ready, but just because they were like, all right, this isn't working kind of thing. Um, and after that, I got back in contact with that girl from Juno, and that's really where um, she introduced me to marijuana, and to alcohol, to cigarettes, and then eventually she introduced me to pills. Um, and then that was pretty much the end of it. My parents told me that I either have to get my life together and I have to turn it around and I have to go to school and I have to do these things or I'm no longer welcome in their home. Um, so because I wouldn't follow those rules, I ended up leaving and I moved in with the people from Juno. And within two weeks of there, my addiction was full blown. Um, we would be doing something every single day. Nobody went to school. I racked up truancy tickets, but I didn't really care at that point. My goal was to just make it to 18 long enough just so I could become a bartender and just, you know, chill and drink whenever I wanted to. Um, which I know is a great goal, but, um, <laughs> so, it was around that time, um, where Michelle Offer was here, and a lot of you guys know her, um, her and her husband, um, decided that they were going to take me in, and that's when, um, I don't know who, family, someone, uh, contacted Slepery that I needed help. And I met with him for the first time in the room back there. Um, I don't remember much from that meeting, but I do remember walking in and him just cheesing, just super big, smiling, and, hey, I'm Slepery! And I was like, oh my gosh, like, who is this guy? Um, but just from talking to him and listening to him, deep down, I knew that's what I wanted. I knew that's what I wanted was to be happy. That's all. All I wanted was to find a place that I fit in. And um, I remember we met. We met quite frequently, um, and he ended up looking into different programs for me. Um, and he found Appalachian Teen Challenge in Princeton, West Virginia, for me, and um, put together the paperwork to get me emancipated because um, I was a minor, 17 when I went. And um, so through the court process and everything, and um, filling out the application, um, I got accepted. And then that was a long while because I had to have certain stuff together, but I was kind of reluctant to go. So Michelle and her husband took me into their home, and I'd be there for a couple of weeks, and I'd be like, Michelle, can I just go hang out with my friends for a little bit? And she'd be like, okay, we'll see. And then I just wouldn't come back for three days, and she'd have to schleck all the way to Juno to come and get me and bring me back. And that happened multiple times until finally she's like, you know what? I'm taking you to Appleton for the weekend, and then you're staying here. It's not happening. So um, we went there, and that's was a couple of weeks before I left. So we left on October 10th. Slepery, Michelle, and I, we drove out to um, West Virginia, and I I knew like I wanted to go, but really the goal was just to stay there long enough until I turned 18 so that my parents didn't have you know legal control over me anymore. So I was like, oh, I can do two months. And I had a plan with my friends, and all right, guys, just wait for me on my birthday. Pick me up at the bus station. I'll come back. It'll be great. Um, so on the way out there, um, I brought earplugs with me because I didn't want to hear them talking about God and Jesus and I didn't want to listen to Christian music on the way out there. And I laugh about that every time I hear, um, yeah, every time I hear Christian music, I think of that. I'm like, oh, I used to wear earplugs and wanted to listen to silence over to listen to Christian music. And um, so we got there and after a couple of days, and um, as soon as we walked on the campus, it was beautiful. Um, we drove up and we met with the admissions director, who was Josh at the time, who's not who I thought he was. He's like that tall, like super beefy, and he's like, hey, you know, God loves you, come on, let's do the paperwork. And I was like, okay, here we go. Um, so doing the paperwork, filling it out, um, I started to get really nervous. 
Because I was like, oh my gosh, like, what if I don't leave? Like, I'm going to be here for an entire year. Like, oh no. Um, so we went down to the Girl Center and um, they introduced me to my big sister, who would kind of be my mentor in the program. She would show me the rules, show me how to make my bed, show me things like that. And everyone around me just kept coming up and hugging me. And if you know me, I'm not really like a touchy-feely kind of person. So everyone coming up to me and being like, hey, I love you, hey, I love you, and like trying to hug me. And I was like, you guys don't even know me. Like, what are you talking about that you love me? And, um, so I had that plan stuck in my mind for like two weeks. But after two weeks, God got a hold of me. And I rededicated my life to Christ while I was at Teen Challenge. Um, and yeah, that was pretty much it. I got my GED when I was in the program. Um, because I didn't finish school, so I got my GED in May of 2016. Um, and then while I was in the program, going through all of that, um, I just felt that God was really calling me to Bible college. I didn't want to go, I wanted to come back here, I wanted to come back home, but like that's not what God needed me to do. So I moved out to Haverhill, Massachusetts in January, almost a year ago, and so since being there, um, since being there, I have um, accepted a job at New Life, home for women and children, um, and that's just, that's my favorite job in the entire world. The staff at Teen Challenge had poured into me so much. Um, my advisor, Heather, she would sit with me because I'm really, really dramatic and I would just amplify everything and I'd be like, they hate me because I got wheat bread and everybody else got white bread and see, I want to like renounce my faith now. And like, she would have to sit with me and call me now and be like, Elijah, let's process this. And it's so crazy because now those are the exact same things that I do in my job. Is I have to be like, look, it's okay, you got a paper plate, we ran out of regular ones, you're fine, you don't need to leave, you're all right. And um, so yeah. So that's pretty much my testimony and where I'm at now. Um, any questions? Anybody? Oh, yeah. How hard has it been for you um, to continue to uh, keep away from drugs? And I'm super blessed in that God called me away, like 23 hour drive away from um, <laughs> where all my friends were and everything. Um, it was really hard when I got back because I was, I got lonely after a while after being home for, I was home for three months before I went to college. And it was during that time that it was really hard for me to stay away from people because I didn't, I didn't have any friends. All my good friends had went away to college and they didn't live in Beaver Dam anymore. So then the only people who were here were the people who, who just don't have their life on track now. So you'd see them everywhere at Walmart, Subway, at the park, everywhere, and they'd come up and be like, Elijah, why didn't you tell me you were back? Um, and it was that part, but my, uh, my dad was like super, super good about like um, keeping me accountable on where I was, and he said that I could use him as an excuse, which worked out great. He's like, oh, I can't hang out, my dad won't let me, so <laughs> that worked out <laughs> Anybody else? Are you going to school and working at the New Life Center? Yeah, um, I am. I was supposed to just intern over the summer at New Life because that's the kind of ministry I want to go into is like work at a Teen Challenge kind of thing. And um, I just really felt that God needed me to stay, that I, my time there was more than just the three months there. So I'm um, going to school half online and half on campus. Anybody else? Oh, okay. <laughs> Slubber's right there. He's the one with the camera and the, you know, do the dreads and, um, <laughs> so his ministry is super, super cool. He, like, finds people like me who are, like, broken, whose families just don't know what to do, and he works with them, and he gets the finances, he gets the court paperwork together, he gets you clothes, he gets you food, he gets you anything that you need, and then takes you out to the program, which is super cool. He's not just, like, putting you on a plane and, like, bye, he, like, takes you there, um, and just make sure that that's the right program for you. So that's, that's kind of what he does. I think I can't really explain it better than that. But any other questions? Yes. Uh, what do you feel that we as a church can do to uh, encourage our high school young people uh, so that they uh, don't get off track? Or uh, I, I know that Teens Challenge is a wonderful rescue mission. But we would like to do preventive care here at Harvest. I think the most important thing is just giving them an ear to listen to. Um, a lot of times you just need somebody to talk to and somebody to not just sugarcoat things. 
that's what I needed. I need someone to tell me how it is, but I also needed them to listen to me at the same time. So if you see like a high school that's struggling, trying to make those relationships, be a mentor to those people, and even if they don't want it, just just keep on pushing. Don't give up on them. Don't be like, all right, well, she doesn't want prayer, so that's okay. Just every single week, then come back. Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? Do you want to go out for coffee? Do you want to go get ice cream? Do you want to do something? And just really making those relationships ahead of time. So when and if when and if you find yourself in a situation like I was, you know that you have go-to people um, that you're comfortable talking with that then can be able to help you.